Okay, so I'm here to see the Lafitte 44 and it is in this slip right here, but the boat isn't there because the owner forgot I was coming and decided he was gonna take his boat out, which actually I take as a good sign. He likes to sail and he likes to sail his boat and it's a beautiful day in Washington. So I'm gonna go down to the dock and film him coming in and mooring and then we'll say hi to him. I don't know if he's gonna be comfortable with the camera or not, so you guys may or may not get to meet him, but afterwards he said he'd give me some alone time on the boat and I'll take you guys through the whole thing. So come with me, let's go down to the dock. Behind me is the Lafitte 44 that we saw on the internet. We're live here from the Lafitte. I'm gonna show you guys today how I vet boats and how I walk through them and what I'm looking for while I'm on them so I don't have to pay a surveyor $1,200 to tell me something's wrong. We're gonna look at how the decks look, bilges, tankage, electronics. We're gonna open every single locker and I'm gonna to try to figure out what's wrong with the boat. The boat is trying to speak to you. All you gotta do is listen and I'm gonna teach you how to deck. So let's go. from the outside. This is called a CQR anchor. That's a crap anchor. I would get rid of this the first thing. Uh, this thing is a, um, what do they call this? A plow anchor, I think. And also anchor. We should have a Mantis and a Rockna, two Rocknas, anything but this combination. He's got a new windlass, which is a very good sign. This thing looks beautiful. It's a Lumar. It looks like one of the more powerful ones and uh, it's a capstan style windlass. So what's cool about these ones is you can actually use another line as a snubber and put it around this and use this as a power winch up here, which sounds weird. Like why would you want a winch when you have the chain gypsy here? I'm telling you, it comes in handy. If you run aground and you just can't get that anchor up or if you're trying to kedge off the ground or something like that, Sometimes you need to tie a rope around the anchor and then use that gypsy because the windlass just won't work otherwise. Another first impression is the roller furler. Obviously, almost all boats nowadays have roller furlers. Some of them don't. Some people prefer not having that because of the problems that, that ensue. But this is a good roller furler. This is the same roller furler I had on Zingaro. It's a, it's a Harkin. Uh, it's, it's mostly plastic parts, but they look in really good shape. It doesn't look like there's been any big major malfunctions with it. And uh, the sail looks like the sacrificial cloth is, is still pretty good. Bow pulpit looks strong. It looks in there. It looks like um, it was built correctly. It's actually not into the deck, which is good. It's bolted onto the tow rail. So this boat has an aluminum tow rail, just like the Islander 36, the Islander 28. Bob Perry just really likes this tow rail. These are LED running lights, which is cool. This was definitely an upgrade that he made in the last, I'd say five years. They look brand new, which tells me that he cares about his boat and he buys the best stuff because these are not cheap. The very next thing I noticed with this boat is it's got a removable staysail stay. This is an awesome feature. Basically what we have is a chain plate going down into the chain locker. This is the bulkhead for the chain locker. And then a tang and you can remove and place a stay that will go here for a smaller sail. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I mean, it's in there and it's good. I think it's, it's pretty good. Wow. 
So what you can do is now we can put a Hank on sail on this thing and what it does is it, it takes the sail area of the boat and brings it inboard. So, I mean, with this little sail, you could probably handle 30 to 50 knots. With this big sail, you could probably handle six to, to 30 knots. So I really, really like this setup. I really, really do. The reason that you do this is because it's hard to get this sail around this stay when you're tacking in light wind. So now we can just get it out of the way and uh, when we're underway, we put the dinghy here, we put this up, we put, we get this other sail ready, the stay sail they call it, the stay sail, the smaller sail that, that fits inside. And when the wind picks up, then you just come up here, raise that sail, and you're good to go. Uh, I really, really like this setup. This is one of the best parts of this boat. I think, you know, in, in a perfect world, you'd have like five furlers. One way out there with a huge sail, smaller sail, smaller sail, smaller sail, smaller sail. But you gotta have like an 80 foot bow for that, and I just don't. Okay, next thing I see is this big ass hatch. I mean, this thing is like probably two and a half feet by two and a half feet square. This is a Bowmore hatch, and it's original, or at least I think it's original to the boat. Some of the things I, th I see right from looking at it is that it's been sealed uh, from the outside by silicone, so this uh, silicone doesn't last very long. It's kind of a shitty way to rebed a hatch. Really what you want to do is take this entire pane out, scrape everything out, clean it up, put new silicone in it, or even better, some kind of Sikaflex or 5200, and then reseat the entire pane of plastic. That's the way to seal the outside of the hatch. And then the inside of the hatch, I've actually told you guys before in a previous video that you can take some AC ducting insulation and actually put it on the outside of these hatches and it seals like crazy. That's what I did on my entire boat. This hatch is leaking and it's probably from here. I can see that there's separation in the original uh, foundation for the plastic piece and really, really easy to fix, just needs to be done right. What I see as a real problem is the prisms. So these are light prisms. They're just a prism hanging under the boat that always allow light into. I can see evidence of these prisms leaking downstairs by the water stains on the cushions because the settee is right under these. There's two of them, one on either side. So these are absolutely gonna have to be rebed. And right now, uh, same thing, they've just got silicone over the top. What needs to happen, the glass has to come out and everything needs to be bedded with butyl tape and smashed back in. Okay, with the mast, I get to see a bunch of things. The preparation and condition of the extrusion, which is the actual mast itself, the way the winches work and how old they are, what kind they are, are they self-tailing, and the running rigging. And if it's got some tracks for a trisail, uh, what the track looks like for the mainsail, and if it's got a track for a spinnaker pole. This one has actually all those things. It's got a Tides Marine track for the mainsail. It's got a track set up for the spinnaker pole or whisker pole, whatever you want to call it. And it's got another track set up just for the trisail, which is a very small main that brings your sail plan really far in if you're really getting pounded by wind, which is awesome to have. Wish I would have had it on Zingaro. This boat has it and it has the sail to go with it. From there, we have some Lumar winches on this side. And these are the old original variant winches on this side. That is a self-tailing winch. This is a non-self-tailing winch. Does it matter? Not really, not at all. Uh, all of the running rigging looks really good. This may be some uh, high tech line. I'm not really sure. Let's see. No, no, it's not, but you know, you never know. You can't win them all. Some of this stuff should be replaced with high tech line. I think the main halyard and the jib halyard and the spinnaker halyard should all be high tech line. They have Dyneema in the center and when they start fraying, they don't just pop. Uh, it could save a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of heartache. On a catamaran, a lot of the times, if you lose a spinnaker halyard and your spinnaker falls in the water, you can actually lose your entire main front beam because it'll just pull it down, pull the whole rig down. So it's very important that you have good lines. Everybody thinks that the standing rigging is the most important part of a sailboat. It's really not. It's all interconnected. The extrusion for the mast has to be strong. The standing rigging has to be strong. The running rigging has to be strong. The running backstays have to be strong if you're flying a kite. If you lose part of it, the whole thing could come crumbling down because the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And if this thing breaks and your 
sail falls in the water and it fills up with water and it pulls your rig down, it's your fault. So the way this boat is set up, it's got running backstays for the staysail. Because it doesn't have any check stays that go up to the intermediate, uh, these ones will handle the load that the staysail will put on the mast in the forward direction. So what you would do is take these off, uh, run them back, tighten them down to probably like a winch or something. And uh, it's nice that they're already set up. That's really cool. So these go up to the second spreaders, the same distance as the staysail stay goes up. So it, it just counteracts that torsional ability from the staysail to pull the mast down. Same thing that you would have with the spinnaker uh, with running back stays running from the top of the mast because now you have a spinnaker running from the top of the mast forward and pulling the boat forward and pulling the mast forward and trying to break it. Okay, first weird part of the boat. This is actually another gangway. Why is it here? Nobody knows. <laughs> I've read a lot about this boat and actually the designer, Robert Perry said, not my best work. <laughs> so uh, I think that this is completely unnecessary. I mean, it's nice. Uh, it's kind of like the Swan-esque where you have a cockpit up front that doesn't have a steering wheel and then the real cockpit in the back, but there's no cockpit here. This is just a, a hole, another hole to leak. It's nice, actually. It's nice to have a, a, a little gangway that goes down where you really don't need one because you already have one. It's not really that nice. Okay, this is one of the better parts of the entire boat. This is called an Iverson Design Dodger. And uh, what this has on it that's really different and really cool is some really, really thick sunbrella material. It's got handholds, it's got the roll up front, and it's got these big Isinglass windows in it, and it's completely pro-built. This is one of the better Dodgers I've ever seen on any monohull boat. And it's pretty much brand new. I think the owner told me he paid like six grand for it or something. So. You, can you do this yourself? Yeah, but this is one of the pro ones that's like super high end and super nice Dodger. The cockpit is surprisingly comfortable uh, for two people. This is amazing. For four, it's probably a little tight and for six, it's really tight. Uh, one of the things it doesn't have is any drink holders. I'd probably have to install some kind of folding up table out here so people can eat. But really, to tell you the truth, for a double ender, this is a huge cockpit and really nice. I'm very happy with that. One of the things you got to look for when you're looking at a boat in the cockpit is how comfortable it will be if you sleep here. It can't be a right angle here. It's got to be a little bit tilted so you can kind of put your, put your head back, put a pillow back, read a book. You know, you're going to spend a lot of time out here. So this is important and this is nice. This is a nice one. This is a really nice addition. This is a Lumar throttle control and it takes the place of those old like throttle controls that you have on sailboats and really makes it effortless to go in reverse and forward to have complete control of the boat. Nice, nice, nice. This is nice. I like that. So for electronics, we have a Navnet 3D, a Furuno, whatever the hell this is. It looks nice. Looks pretty cool, this one. And then we have our wind instrument. Uh, this is the old version. Uh, there's a lot newer versions now. What I really would like here is an autopilot, but there is none. So moving to the back of the boat, we have the backstay. Every monohull boat has one, and this one has an insulator for an SSB antenna. So if you ever see a wire running up on the outside of the, of the backstay, that is for SSB. So that's kind of cool. I've never really had one and I've never used it. I don't care to talk to people that much, but maybe one of you guys would be like, hey Zingaro, what are you doing? More importantly, it's got a hydrovane wind steering system. This, this hydrovane is the top of the line for wind steering systems. It's got its own rudder that comes down. So you don't have lines coming into your wheel like the monitor wind vents do. Um, I'm not sure if this one has a cover still, but it's got this thing that attaches to this thing that will allow you to have an autopilot out to sea from a tiller pilot. Normal autopilots are like between $1,500 and $3,500. This one's 400 bucks. The problem with this one is, if this is the only autopilot on this boat, the rudder on this hydrovane is so small that there's no, there's no way it would even work if you were going slow or if you were in tight quarters or uh, pretty much any time other than just sailing along at six knots. 
So not the, not the right thing to have for a cruising boat's only autopilot. I think that you should have a hydraulic or linear drive auto autopilot downstairs, and then this upstairs for the times that you're either motoring or in open ocean or just chucking along at six knots using the, using the wind vane. These are your main working winches for your jib sheets. They're Bariant 32s. They look like Lumar 52s. Really what you want to look for with the winch is you can take these bolts out and you can take the top off and you can take and look at all the gears, but just kind of feel it and see, you know, is it is it smooth? Uh, most of these older winches have bronze gears inside them and they're not going to be all chewed up unless they've been working way over time. And these big ones probably not. This one feels great. Okay guys, let's go in the boat and we'll see what's going on inside. This is where shit starts to get a little weird. Okay, so now that we're inside the boat, we're in this little passageway between the aft cabin and the galley settee area. Let's just go into the galley settee area. We'll show you the aft cabin later. What we have here is a huge settee. This is nice. It's green, which is crazy bad, but this will fit six easy. It's got a lot of opening lockers that are integral to the boat. They're made from really high quality teak. You could fit a lot of books in there, obviously. Look. We've got books on radar. We've got books on coastal and offshore weather. We've got inland and coastal navigation. It's books galore. Let's check out the kitchen, or as we say in the boater language, the galley. Okay, here's the coup de grace of almost the entire boat. This is a real cook's galley. And I don't know if you ever saw me on Zingaro, but I was always like kind of bending over to cook. Look at how much headroom. I mean, I'm 5'11". There's gotta be three inches above me. So if you're 6'2 or under, the Lafitte's probably a pretty damn good boat for you. It's got a stove, it's got an oven, it's got a freezer and a fridge and enough counter space where you can actually make good meals here. Uh, a lot of people I've seen on these Lafitte's that they put spice racks in and they have their spice rack here and they have their food here and they have their dishes here. I love it, I wanna cook something right now. Almost the best part of this boat is the engine. This thing has 200 hours on it. It's a Kabuta Beta engine and uh, it's in pretty sharp shape. It's got a really big alternator on it. Uh, the fuel pump looks brand new. The, the, everything looks brand new on this thing. It's really nice. That's, that's one of the key parts about a boat. You know, you gotta have a good engine. 200 hours on the engine. That's worth about 20 grand. Okay, let's go forward to the V-berth and I'll show you uh, what the accommodations look like here. All right, this is the V-berth and... <laughs> so this is the V-berth. Let's get in here without hitting our heads. This is our asymmetrical spinnaker in a sock. This is a probably a $2,500 sail. Nice. And then this is our staysail sail and this is our hydrovane wind vane vein there's plenty of storage over here these sails would obviously have to go somewhere else chain locker here this is how a sailor stows his sails they're always in the v-berth because <laughs> you can just reach down in here and grab them and do your thing but it looks to me like there's there's some water damage uh, up here there's some cracking in the headliner so honestly all the headliners need to be replaced on this boat yeah all of them do so one really cool thing about the V-berth on this boat is you can close it off and have complete privacy. So it's its own master cabin. And then, whoo, sorry buddy. And then it's got its own head here. Forward head is really nice in this boat. Everything has latches because on a monohull boat you absolutely need latches everywhere or else you get this whole like thing going on where you can't sleep and this drives you crazy and then you just end up shoving your first bone child right in the gap between to just stop the madness all right let's go see the afterbirth okay so this is the afterbirth it's plenty big for two people 
and uh, there's a little seating area right behind where you guys are looking at me. In your perspective, you'd be seating in that area with your little workshop. And yes, it's not a humongous bed that takes up the entire aft quadrant, but what you have is a stoutly built boat with like, these are structural bulkheads and there's plenty of room for two people. And even if you, if you sleep this way, oh yeah, that's nice. You can just sit us back here. You know, I'm just doing setups. This is something I could never do in Zingaro. This, this couldn't happen. The guy that had this before me really took the time to have so much work done on the boat. I mean, every single hose is, is replaced. Uh, all the tanks look good. There's a couple of things that I would definitely change and I'm gonna show you guys that right now. So the reason that this looks so messed up and it's falling apart and there's pieces of wood coming out of it is because there's something leaking here. Probably, if I had to guess, uh, maybe the hatch, maybe a piece of hardware, uh, maybe the track for the Genoa. I'm not really sure what's here, but something is leaking and destroying the wood. And basically what this boat is, is it's a shell of fiberglass with quarter inch plywood with uh, vinyl over the top of it. So honestly, I've seen the boat and all of the quarter inch plywood on the top needs to be replaced. Um, it's gonna be, a, I didn't even touch it. It's gonna be a big job. Uh, and it's not only that, like that's not even the biggest job. What is the biggest job is trying to rebed everything that's leaking upstairs. Because the boat has teak decks, over the years with the sun and the rain and the cold, they expand and contract until they just rip themselves out of the deck and it is leaking like a sieve. It rained pretty hard before we got here, which is one of the reasons I wanted to come and see this boat today. And the rain was just pissing in. There was standing water all over the place. There's water stains all over the place. Those decks need to be ripped up and the whole deck needs to be fiberglass. Everything needs to be rebedded. It's a huge job. It's not cosmetic. It's not what everybody thinks is, oh, I just, I did everything. It's just not the cosmetic shit. This is almost the most important thing because you're not gonna be happy on passage if you're in a wet bed. So let me show you some of the water stains. Okay, so here's one of the spots where the boat's trying to talk to you and tell you what's wrong with it. This big stain right here, this stain is telling you that something above it is leaking and there's only one thing above it and that's that prism. So that prism needs to be completely rebedded. It should have been done a long time ago, but now you've just ruined the settee because it hasn't been done. Another water stain mark that's happening right here is on the veneer of this wood. Uh, what this is, is plywood with a very, very thin veneer of teak on it. And you can see that this window is completely leaking. All of this, all of this. Uh, this may be able to be sanded out and re-varnished, but you may just have to replace this entire piece of veneer, which would be a pain in the ass. This window also needs rebedded. It's got the same stains in it. You can see them right here. So you guys can't see this and there really is no staining marks yet, but this was sopping wet when we came in here. And the reason being we figured out was coming from this. Uh, this is where the jib sheet track goes. So I'm thinking that the jib sheet track needs rebedded, but it, it actually could be the teak decks. <laughs> I hit my head again. <laughs> it's like the 80th time. All right, now this is the little sitting area that's across from the aft cabin. I'm not really sure what this is for, other than maybe you can come back here and cry if you're not feeling too good. But this is probably the worst headliner in the entire boat. It's bad. I mean, look at this. It's so bad. I bet you if you took this off, it would just crumble. To tell you the, the truth, guys, the entire boat has a leaking problem. Um, it's common with these old teak decks and honestly it's gonna have to be ripped up so i'm gonna have to take out roughly 1600 screws pry the teaks off the decks probably replace pieces of the decks that have gotten water intrusion and then once i've gotten all the plywood done i can put two or three layers of glass down and then paint it uh, that's a huge job huge job i wouldn't i wouldn't do the job for less than five grand ten grand maybe uh, and then after that's done, all of these rotten plywood 
headliners need to come off, be recut, and then the vinyl, new vinyl put on them. It's a huge, humongous job. Um, do I want to do it? No. Do, would I do it? Yeah, for the right price. If I got this boat for 60 grand and I can put in mm, probably a thousand dollars in money and maybe two months in work, uh, yeah, it would be a good deal, but I'd rather not have to. So maybe that's a deal breaker. This could be the deal breaker for this boat. Uh, it's got a lot of cruising gear, but it doesn't have an autopilot. It has really leaky decks. I mean, there was at least, what would you say, Ryan, like five spots that were pouring water when we came in? At least. Yeah, it was bad. I mean, at this point, the entire electrical system has been redone. Uh, the fuel system has been redone. All the hoses have been redone. The water system has been redone. And the Dodger, the sails, the hydrogen wind steering, and it's got a Jordan Series Drogue and, a, and, a, and a, uh, all of the gypsy and ground tackle have been redone. And the forward uh, whole anchor locker. So overall, the boat doesn't have a boat smell, which is good because it means the guy's using it and it means it's not rotting. It, it needs all new cushions. It needs probably a mattress back here and a mattress in the front v -berth. And then big, huge job is to actually seal everything, all the windows that are leaking, uh, rip the teak decks off, put some fiberglass down. I'd say like three months I'd, I'd need to work on this boat, but then it would be a $100,000 boat that can go around the world. So do I buy this or do I wait? What do you think? <laughs>